All right, so now we're going to come to chapter 4 of Ezra. Chapter 4 of Ezra, verses 1 through 2. So it says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Eshadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Verse 3, But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel said to them, You may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we will alone build to the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. So we first see that there are these adversaries, the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, and these are the adversaries, these are the Samaritans. Once Assyria took over the northern kingdom of Israel, they had intermarriage, and so some of them got scattered around, um, around the kingdom. And so these are the Samaritans, or these are the adversaries of Judah. And the word adversary, another word for adversary is, is enemies or oppressors. And it says in 2 Kings 17.24 exactly who they were. It says, Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Katha, Abba, Hamath, and from Sepravim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in the cities. And so these adversaries heard that Judah was rebuilding the temple. Maybe from chapter 3 when they had this celebration, Right after they lay down the altar and the foundation, they, they rejoice. So maybe they've heard that, man, they heard some noise and they saw, man, these, Judah's are actually taking this seriously. They're actually trying to get right with God. And so these people, these adversaries, were actually people who not only just said that they worshipped Yahweh, but they actually worshipped a plethora of different gods. And so they were not to take part in the work of God because they would pollute the work of God and pollute the people of God. And in 2 Kings 17.33 through, through 41, it tells us the attitude of these adversaries, of these Samaritans. It says in 2 Kings 17, verses 33 to 41, that they feared the Lord, yet served their own gods, according to the rituals of the nations from among whom they were carried away. To this day, they continue practicing the former rituals. They do not fear the Lord, nor do they follow their statutes or their ordinances, or the law and commandment which the Lord had commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel, with whom the Lord had made a covenant and charged them, saying, You shall not fear other gods, nor bow down to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But the Lord, who brought you up from the land of Egypt with great power and an outstretched arm, him you shall fear, him you shall worship, and him you shall offer sacrifice. And the statutes, the ordinances, the law, and the commandment which he wrote for you, you shall be careful to observe forever. You shall not fear other gods. And the covenant that I have made with you, you shall not forget, nor shall you fear other gods, but the Lord your God you shall fear, and he will deliver you from the hand of your enemies. However, they did not obey but they followed former rituals. So these nations feared the Lord, yet served their carved images. Also their children and their children's children have continued doing as their fathers did, even to this day. And we see this in our society today. Many different people can say that they're, they're Christians, like Jehovah's and Jehovah's Witness and Mormons, but they worship a totally different Jesus that cannot save. It's a false Christ. And some churches are, we even see nowadays, they're, they're allowing homosexual people to come into the church and to serve with the body. And it's perverted. But this is the work of Satan. Paul told us, talked about these people who are deceitful workers in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Paul also called those who 
legalistically put more requirements on salvation than simple faith in Christ. He called these guys false brethren in Galatians 2.4. In Galatians 2.4, Paul said, And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Trying to put a heavy yoke on salvation, which is only faith in Christ Jesus. Adding works. And then in Jude, Jude said that those who claim to be Christians, yet they practice sin in the name of grace. It says that, that they deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's good that we are to be drawing people, unsaved people, to Christ, bringing them into church, right? That's what we're supposed to do. But at the same time, we need to also be careful that the core foundation of what we live and what we do and what we gather together to do is in the name of Jesus. And all we do is for Jesus. We don't compromise with sin. Jesus doesn't compromise with sin. And the church, we don't compromise with carnality. We don't compromise with false doctrine, right? We don't compromise with the wolves and sheep's clothing, too. And, and now we're moving on to Ezra chapter 4, but we're called to be in the world, right? We're not called to be a part of the world system. We're called to be set apart. And it's good, like, as we're in this world to make a change, right, by the power of the Holy Spirit, fulfilling the Great Commission. And so as we're in the world sharing the gospel, we have a lot of unbelieving friends, co-workers, it's good to, if we're putting ourselves in a position where we're around them constantly, if we're making a change in their life, then praise the Lord. That's what we need to do. But if we're allowing culture and unbelievers to change how we are, then we have a problem. And so that's what these adversaries are trying to do. They, they were trying to pretend that they were friends, but they were actually enemies, and they are trying to infiltrate God's people. And so verse 3. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers said to them, You may do nothing with us to build the house of God, but we alone will build the Lord to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. And so Zerubbabel and, and Jeshua, they used discernment, and they denied them because they wanted, again, to keep the worship of God pure and undefiled. For a house divided cannot stand. What fellowship does light have with darkness, Right? Now moving on to verse 4 and 5. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of King Cyrus, Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And so now the light has been revealed. They weren't really friends of these guys. They were actually enemies. And over time, people's true colors will show. And we know that the Samaritans were not friends of God's people, but they're enemies. And so they attacked them. And they did, they did this by focusing on three areas. We see in this, in this verse, in discouragement, in trouble, and in frustration. And this is what Satan does. And God's people... We're going to see later that they're just so worn out and beat up by the enemy that they end up quitting. And they stop building the temple for many years, up to 16 years, 15 to 16 years. Maybe you get discouraged at times. Maybe, I know I do. I was discouraged this morning. Maybe you're discouraged today or tonight. Maybe you feel like giving up on something. The enemy is saying, you're just wasting your time. Just stop. Well, these are the attacks of the enemy. And the enemy wants you to stop doing the work of the Lord. He wants you to do nothing. He wants you to give up. But a word of encouragement, wherever there's discouragement in your life, the Lord wants to encourage you. He said, hey, don't, don't give up. Keep praying for your children. Don't, don't give up on your, on your relationship. You know, keep, keep going. I'm, I'm going to give you the strength. Don't give up on the ministry. You know, don't lose heart. Get your eyes back on me. Remember my grace. Remember that I created all things, and in, in me all things consist, and you're my child. Remember in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, when David was distressed, when he had all these enemies coming against him, 
he didn't he didn't jump ship. He didn't hide like King Saul. It said that he strengthened himself in the Lord. And then there's trouble that they experience, or fear. Another word for trouble is fear. Making it seem like the world is against you. Have you ever felt that? Proverbs 29, 25 says that the fear of man brings a snare, but those who trust in the Lord shall be safe. You're safe under the shelter of God. And then there's frustration, we see. Maybe you're frustrated with your job. You're frustrated with your children or a loved one. You're frustrated in doing God's work. You're frustrated in sharing the gospel, but you can't. You're getting opposed. Satan's trying to hinder you. Or how many times when you're trying to go to church and you get frustrated at home and you, you lash out on a family member or something and then you drive to church and you get in the parking lot and you're just like, you just feel like the biggest hypocrite and you're like, fine, now I, now I get to go to church and I should just go home and turn around now. These are attacks of the enemy. These are attacks of the enemy. But if you're spiritually minded, we can catch these attacks. Don't let the enemy frustrate you. Don't let the enemy put you in a place where you're just trapped in one spot where you're not doing anything for the Lord. It says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We should know that whenever you try to do something for the Lord, there's going to be some sort of opposition. Every time you're trying to go to church, every time you're trying to get on your knees and pray, every time you wake up and you want to open up God's Word, you're going to get attacked somehow. Some sort of excuse is going to happen. These are the attacks of the enemy. He doesn't want, he hates what God loves to do. Satan hates it. And so there's times when you want to seek the Lord, you want to be in fellowship, you want to read God's word, you want to share the gospel. Every single hindrance that tries to come in the way, it's attack of the enemy. So now from verses 6 through 23, Ezra is going to now break out in chronological narrative. And now he's going to talk about these oppositions that also took place as well. So from verses 6 through 23, this chronicle is going to take place actually after the construction of the temple, which was finished in 515 B.C. And so these next verses that we're going to read, Ezra's point is to give you an overall picture of the opposition that the Jews consistently faced. And so this is, this is the same in Zerubbabel's time as it was in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And so verse 6. So in the reign of Ahasuerus, and this is the same Ahasuerus as Queen Esther's husband, in the beginning of his reign, they, the enemies of the Jews, wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In verse 7, in the days of Artaxerxes also, Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabel, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the letter was written in Aramaic script and translated into the Aramaic language. And so this Artaxerxes came after Ahasuerus, and he reigned from 464 B.C. to 424 B.C., and so from Cyrus, king of Persia, then came the reign of Cambyses, and then came the reign of Smyrdas, and then Darius, which we'll see later on, and then Xerxes and Artaxerxes comes and takes over. So this is a little future picture, a little parenthesis showing what happened in Nehemiah's time as Ezra is writing these things down, seeing them. And they actually ha some, these things happened as well in the time of Zerubbabel. And so it's hard, hard for our, our Western mind to understand this. But in, in this time, as we have to realize that Ezra wasn't even either not even born or very young. And he's going to come into the picture 60 years later. And so that's why he's, he's painting this picture and he's showing basically the overall picture that, hey, there's still opposition taking place throughout this entire time until the time of King Cyrus. Darius. And it also says that the letter was written in Aramaic, which is interesting. Some people think that the Bible is only in Hebrew, Old Testament, and the New Testament's Greek, but there's also a lot of Aramaic in the Bible too. 
So from chapter 4, verse 8, to chapter 6, verse 18, also in chapter 7, verses 12 to 26, these portions are also written in Aramaic as well. But to make it easier on us, it's translated in English. So, verse 8 now. So Rahum, the commander, and Shimshai the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes in this fashion. From Rahum the commander, Shimshai the scribe, and the rest of the companions, representatives of the Dinites and the Pharsachites and the Tarpalites, the people of Persia and Erech and Babylon and Shushan, the Dehavitives, the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapper, which is the, the king of Assyrians at the time, took captive and settled in the cities of Samaria and the remainder beyond the river, which is the river of Euphrates, and so forth. So this, these are just the enemies of Judah. Now verse 11. This is a copy of the letter that they sent to him, to King Artaxerxes, from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river, and so forth. Let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. And unfortunately, this was true. They did re rebel under various oppressive times uh, in the course of history. For example, they, they rebelled against the king of Assyria, and they, came, they rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar as well when Babylon um, overtook Judah. And so these documents of this rebellion can easily be found in the king's record and be verified. In verse 13, Continuing on, he says, Let it now be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute, or custom, and the king's treasury will be diminished. Now, because we received support from its palace, it was not proper for us to see the king's dishonor. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king that a search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers, and you will find in the book of records... And know that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to the kings and provinces. And that they have incited sedition within the city in former times, for which cause this city was destroyed. In verse 16, we inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. And so these people are saying if, if Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt, then, man, hey, king, your taxes are going to go down, your income's going to go down, and you're going to lose control over all the west of the Euphrates. In verse 17, it says, the answer to the king now back, says, the king sent an answer to Rahim, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, to the rest of their companions who dwell in Samaria, and to the remainder beyond the river, peace and so forth. The letter which you sent to us has been clearly read before me, and I gave the command, and a search has been made, and it was found that the city in former times has revolted against kings, and rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. There have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem, such as David and Solomon, and uh, who have ruled over all the region beyond the river of Euphrates, and tax, tribute, and customs were paid to them. Now, give the command to make these men cease, that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. Take heed now that you do not fail to do this. Why should damage increase to the hurt of the kings? In verse 23, Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rahum, Shimshai the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews, and by force of arms made them cease. And so God's people, man, they had persistent and relentless enemies who were against them. And they're trying to condemn them and accuse them. And the Bible tells us in Revelation 12 that Satan is the accuser of the brother in day and night. It says in Revelations 12, 10 through 11, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, John speaking, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, 
and they did not love their lives till death. And then we're also told in 1 John 2, 1, that we have an advocate with God, Jesus Christ, our righteousness. He's our defense attorney against the accuser. It says in 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. If you, anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so we have to remember, in the midst of any sort of opposition that you're going through, any sort of warfare or discouragement, or if you're feeling condemned or accused by something, you have to remember that Jesus Christ defeated Satan on the cross and through his resurrection, seated on the right hand of the throne of God and lives to make intercession for us. And so we get to, as a child of God, we get to claim victory by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, faith in Christ Jesus. We don't love our lives unto death. Jesus Christ is our Lord. He's our master. He's our defender. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. doesn't matter how far you've been backslidden. The Lord loves you. If you confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And so when these times of attacks come against you in many different ways, the Lord knows your heart. He knows your mind. He knows what you're going through. What does James say? He says, therefore, submit to God, right? Resist the devil. He will flee. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. In James 4, 7. Now, from verse 24, the narrative comes back to the original opposition from verse 5 during the reign of Cyrus in 536 B.C. So it says in verse 24, Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So for 16 years, from 536 B.C. to 520 B.C., the work of the rebuilding of the temple was halted, and King Darius has now preceded Cyrus. Now, continue on to chapter 5, verse 1. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. And so at this point of time, after the work has been ceased, God's people were discouraged. They were defeated. They were depressed. And so these two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, who were sent by God, were called to these people to encourage the people to not lose heart and to rebuild the temple. And they knew, of course, that it was God's will for them to rebuild the temple. And that King Cyrus originally gave the decree to rebuild the temple. And so what they were doing to not rebuild the temple, even though the government told them to stop, was against the word of God. Paul said we rather to obey God rather than men. And so they knew it was God's will and it was God's time to rebuild the temple. They shouldn't be waiting this long. And so these two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, I encourage you guys to read these two books. Haggai has only like two chapters. Zechariah has about ten and so Haggai's message was right down to the point. He wasn't messing around. And his type wasn't popular. And it's still not popular today. And so if you have a Bible, you turn to Haggai chapter 1. It's also on the notes too as well. And you could see what was going on during these 16 years of Judah being complacent and hindered from rebuilding the temple. So in Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, and then chapter, or in the verse 4, and then 6 through 8, it says that in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, or Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, Judah, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. It's not time to be built. They're trying to spiritualize it. Oh, no, I think God doesn't want us to build the house. No. 
And then it says that in verse 4, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? This is the Lord's response. Is it time for yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? You have sown much and, and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. So these people were making excuses. Saying, it's not time to build, rebuild a temple. And they stopped putting God first. And, and they, they made their houses into idols. And Haggai was like, no wonder why you're never satisfied. Because you're, you're living in sin. And you're not where you need to be. Repent. Re- rebuild the temple. The money's just going down through your, through your pockets. And you're not satisfied. You're spending all your money on your houses instead of the work of the Lord. And so this was Haggai's message. It was bold. It was straight to the point. Now, Zechariah was an entirely different person. He was, he was positive, and he had a tremendous vision and a message to match the vision as well. And he, he appealed to the emotions of the people. Haggai appealed to the mind of people. And when they saw Haggai, they're like, oh man, I better get to work. But when, when Zechariah came, he spoke to their heart, and he, he spoke to this generation also, about the future Messiah, of his first coming, riding on the colt in Zechariah 9, and then his second coming in Zechariah, later on in Zechariah 10 and 12. And so in Zechariah 4, 6 and 9, Zechariah said, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple, his hands shall also finish it. Then you know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Wow, super encouraging. And so these two men together, Haggai and Zechariah, they spoke to the conscience of the heart of Israel as representatives of God. And we need this in our lives too. We need to take heed to rebuke. We need to also take heed to the encouragement of God as well. And we also need to understand that in every aspect of our lives, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to work in us first and then through us. And if we don't rest on the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, if we want to do things in our own understanding, we're going to get drained. And so if you feel like your life is just drained Ask your Heavenly Father to give you a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit because He wants to refresh you and fill you. And so now in verse 2, it says, So Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, and Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. And so the word of the Lord through the prophets renewed their desire to finish the work that God had given them. And they obeyed God rather than men and got back to building the temple. I quoted the verse earlier, but in Acts 5.29, it says, But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. If the government's telling you to do something that's totally contradicting God's word, you don't do that. If the government's doing wicked and and trying to pull a country into do wickedness, yeah, should I submit to to the government? Well, if the government's doing wickedness, then why would I do wickedness either? So in, in, in these cases, we ought to obey God rather than men, following after righteousness, no longer living in, in a, a lifestyle being pulled away by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so in Ezra chapter 5, verse 3 now, continuing on, it says that at the same time, Tatanai, the governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethar Banzai and their companions came to them and spoke thus to them. Who has commanded you to build this temple and finish this wall? So this man, Tatanai, he was appointed by the king of Persia to govern the providence 
including Judea, and his companions just doing what they were called to do. And they just wanted to know why the work was being rebuilt and why the, the temple had been resumed. It was just their duty. They weren't were totally sure why. And verse 4 says, Then accordingly we, we told them the names of the men who were constructing this building. And verse 5 it says, But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, so that they could not make them cease till a report could go to Darius. Then a written answer was returned concerning this manner. So Zerubbabel, you know, he gave Tatanai the names who were building the temple, you know, just to demonstrate compliance. And then it says in verse 5, that the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews. And so the Lord, through his divine providence and his power and his love, looked favorably upon his people, and he smiled on them, and he encouraged them in the work by his good spirit. It says in Second Chronicles 16.9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And it says, In this case you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. And so the eye of the Lord is on his people. We have to remember that. There's nothing that's hidden from God. He sees the evil. He sees the good. He knows his people individually. And the eye of God was upon the elders of the Jews, and he had favor upon them as well. And so Tatanai, the governor, he's going to be explaining now to Darius in, in the letter of this conversation with Zerubbabel and the Jewish leaders that he had. And so in verse 6 through 11, here's what Tatanai said. So this is the copy of the letter that Tatanai sent. The governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethar Banzai and his companions, the Persians who were in the region beyond the river, to Darius the king. In verse 17 it says that they sent a letter to him in which was written, thus to Darius the king, all peace. Let it be known to the king that we went into the province of Judah, to the temple of the great God, which is being built with heavy stones and timber is being laid in the walls. And this work goes on diligently and prospers in their hands. Then we asked those elders and spoke to us, to them, who commanded you to build the temple and to finish these walls. We also asked them their names to inform you that we might write the names of the men who were chief among them. And thus they returned us an answer saying, we are the servants of God, of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and completed. And in verse 12 through 16, it continues on, But because our fathers provoked the God of heaven to wrath, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this temple and carried the people away to Babylon. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, king Cyrus issued a decree to build this house of God. Remember this, we read this in chapter 1. Verse 14, also, the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple that was in Jerusalem and carried into the temple of Babylon, those king Cyrus took from the temple of Babylon, and they were given to one named Sheshbazar, or Zerubbabel, which would be his Chaldean name, whom he had made governor. And verse 15, it says that, And he said to them, Take these articles, go, carry them to the temple site that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be rebuilt on its former site. Then the same Sheshbazar came and laid the foundation of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. But from that time, even until now, it has been under construction, and it is not finished. Verse 17, Now therefore, if it seems good to the king, let a search be made in the king's treasure house, which is there in Babylon, whether it is so that a decree was issued by King Cyrus to build this house of God at Jerusalem, and let the king send us his pleasure concerning this matter. So a lot of scriptures there. But Tatanai, so he asked King Darius to, to research this matter, to determine, you know, hey, was this temple really supposed to be rebuilt, and the Cyrus, did he really give this decree? And, and it was. And we're going to see that Darius did find this in chapter 6. And so in chapter 6, verse 1, continuing on, then King Darius, 
issued a decree, and a search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon and at Akmatha in the, pla- in the palace that is in the province of Media, a scroll was found and in the record was written thus. And so Darius, he, he found a decree that Cyrus originally gave. And it's interesting, it says that at the, they found this, this decree at Akmatha in the palace that is in the province of Media. There's multiple provinces And so, do you know how hard it would be to find this one decree? I mean, imagine that. This was years ago when this decree was given. I mean, I could sometimes I could barely find something like in my folders on the computer, or those those paperwork that you have stored up, right, in 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 a special spot. Like, dude, this was hard to find. And so, this was a work of God. This was definitely a work of God to, to find this decree, and they actually searched out to find it. And so he found it. This is in Ezra, chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. So in the first year of King Cyrus, King Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt, that the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations of it be firmly laid. Its height, 60 cubits, and its width, 60 cubits. With three rows of heavy stones and one row of new timber, let the expenses be paid from the king's treasury, and also let the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple, which is in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, be restored and taken back to the temple, which is in Jerusalem, each to its place, and deposit them in the house of God. And so Darius would have never known about this decree if the enemies have never even mentioned it. And so we could definitely see God's hand in this. And just like God's word, the Lord sustained his word throughout all these years. And even though the heavens and the earth will pass away, his word will by no means pass away. And it's amazing that and how God can turn something around what the enemy meant for evil. God could turn it around for good. And so wherever the enemy has tried to kill in your life, whatever it is, kill your devotion life, many other things you can think of, wherever the enemy tried to kill, steal and destroy, God can heal in your life. Wherever the enemy has tried to steal in your life, maybe he's maybe stolen years of your life of living in sin, God can repay. Wherever the enemy has tried to destroy in your life, your family, your ministry, your fi- whatever it is, God can restore. And he's still in the business of doing that. And just like Darius commanded that all the articles of the temple that were stolen to be returned back to Judah. And so Darius continues on now in verse 6. Now therefore, Tatanai, the governor of the region beyond the river, and Sheth Barbanzai and your companions, the Persians who are beyond the river, Keep yourselves far from there. Don't get near them. Verse 7, Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God on its site. And so Darius is like, Hey, hey, Tatanai, hey, stay far away from the Jews. They will continue to rebuild the house of God. In verse 8-10, through 10, Moreover, I issue a decree as to what you shall do for the elders of the Jews. For the building of this house of God, let the cost be paid at the king's expense from taxes on the region beyond the river. This is to be given immediately to these men so that they are not hindered. And whatever they need, young bulls, rams, lambs, for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the request of the priests who are in Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail. Verse 10, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet aroma to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. <laughs> Just added on that. And so not only was the rebuilding allowed to continue, but it would also be financed by the Persians. And this is a great, great picture 
of God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think according to the power that works in us. Just as God restored back what Job had lost, doubled it, He's still in the business of restoring what the locust has eaten in your life as well. And He shows Himself mighty on your behalf as your heart's loyal to Him. It says in Ephesians 3.20, Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. It's Him, not us. To God be the glory great things He has done. He gets the glory. And I love how in verse 10, Darius said that, Hey, yeah, you know, that they may offer sacrifices, a sweet aroma to the God of heaven and, and pray for the life of the king and his sons. And so you can just see the motivation of the king as well. You know, he also wanted prayer for himself and for his sons. He saw how powerful this God is. And so I, I believe I'm going to see Darius in heaven, but we'll see. In verse 11 through 12 now, continuing on. Also, I issue a decree that whoever alters this edict... Let a timber be pulled from his house and erected and let him be hanged on it and let his house be made a refuse, a heap because of this. And may the God who causes his name to dwell there destroy any king or people who put their hand to alter it or to destroy this house of God, which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, issue a decree. Let it be done diligently. This kind of reminds me of those people in Haman who sought to destroy Mordecai and the Jews in the book of Esther, right? And it, the plan backfired. When Haman was trying to hang Mordecai, Haman was the one that got hung. And it's a powerful illustration as well as the proverb says in Proverbs 21.1, that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. He who digs a pit will fall into it. He who tries to roll a stone will have the stone rolled back onto him. And verse 13 through 18. Then Tatanai, governor of the region beyond the river, Shethar, Banzai, and their companions diligently did according to what King Darius had sent. So the elders of the Jews built, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, and they built and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. In verse 15 it says, Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. In 515 B.C. And so the, the temple was finished on the third day. Pretty cool, right? Just as Christ rose on the third day. And in verse 16, continues on, it says, Then the children of Israel, the priests, and the Levites, and the rest of the descendants of the captivity celebrated the dedication of this house of God with what? With joy. And they offered sacrifices at the dedication of this house of God. 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they assigned the priests to their divisions and the Levites to their divisions over the service of God in Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. And so they made sure that the work of the temple from now on would function properly. The Bible says that whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. Whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. And that's what they're starting to do now. They're trying to get everything running properly, have some order. Verse 19 through 22 it says, And the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves. All of them were ritually clean, and they slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity, for their brethren, the priests, and for themselves. And we know that Christ is our Passover lamb, right, who was slain for us. 
It says in Isaiah 53, 7, that he was oppressed. Speaking of Jesus, he was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And that's our God. That's, that's who we serve. That's who we, we deserve to be slaughtered, right? We, we, we deserve to. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. But the gift of God is eternal life. And Christ was that gift that we can have eternal life. He lived the perfect life that we can never live. He died the death that we deserve. By his stripes we are healed. And we can rejoice in that. He didn't just die. He rose from the grave. And so they're getting back to the celebrating the Passover after all these years. And verse 21, Then the children of Israel who had returned from the captivity ate together with all who had separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with what? With joy. For the Lord made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria towards them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. So the Jews wanted to separate themselves from the filth of the nation or in order to seek the Lord as God's covenant people. And we also know that leaven, and they celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread, leaven in the Bible is a symbolism of sin. It says in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, Paul speaking to the church who is living in sin, some of them, it says, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Paul's not talking about salvation here, no. He's talking about the walk of the believer now. Paul says in Romans 6.11 that we reckon ourselves dead indeed to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We're told to abhor what is evil hate what is evil, and cling to what is good, not to act as the world acts. There are many things that we can be led astray to in this world. But as that song says, you can have all this world but give me Jesus. And so the believer is called to be set apart from how the world lives, to be, not, to be set apart from justifying sin, but instead pursue righteousness. Not get entangled with the cares of this world as a good soldier in Christ, but instead live to please the Lord. Our unbelieving family members and our unbelieving co-workers and those people who we pass by and we, we talk with, they can curse all they want. They can, they can get drunk all they want. They can steal and you know, cheat on their taxes. You know, they're going to give an account on the day of judgment. But as Christians, we're not, we're not supposed to be living like them, right? The Bible says that we're going to give account of every idle word we say as well. And so we're called to be holy and set apart for the Lord and not to live as the heathens, as we once lived, right? And so we're called to be a light in this world and shine into the dark world. Let your light so shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The world's seen us always just with a pouty face and angry and cursing at people and just gossiping and doing all these things that an that a unbeliever would do. That's not a good witness. And so we see that Judah, we see these people, they, they separated themselves from the filth of the nations in order to seek the Lord. And there's something beautiful. You know, we can do the rich, we can do all the religious things all we want. But the sacrifices of the Lord are a broken and a contrite spirit. That he will not 
resist. And so when we come to the Lord with a repentant heart and a broken heart, getting right with God first in your heart, everything else flows from that. Everything else flows from that. And so we're called to do whatever God's called you to do personally. If you ask yourself today, what has God called you to do? What, is, what are the gifts that God has given to you? you can, we can live our lives so long and not know the gifts and the callings that God has called you to do. If you take some time and, and think about your life, of people coming up to you and asking for prayer and, and for questions, maybe you have, and you might have the gift of counseling. What are your gifts? What has God called you to do? We're called to build the God's kingdom, minister to one another as well as the body of Christ. We're called to share the gospel. And that could happen in different ways. So what is the work that God has called you individually? Sometimes we have different seasons in our lives that where God calls us to do something for a season. But in the season that you're in now, what has called you to do? What work has God placed in your, in your life? What gifts has He given you in the, in the realm that you're living in? Or maybe you're in the section of, man, you're You've been discouraged by the enemy. Maybe you're in a place of the 16 years of not doing anything. And maybe you're realizing, wow, you know, now's the time. Tomorrow's not promised. You're seeing all the signs of the times of the, of the coming of Christ. And man, you're realizing, man, if I were to do something for the Lord now and share the gospel, maybe even just dive deeper in the word of God and get back to my prayer life and to sharing the gospel like I used to, man, Today's that day. Today's that day. Whatever the Lord's speaking to you, I encourage you, just as the prophets encouraged Judah, and as the Lord encouraged them, get back up and re- rebuild. Whether it's something in your heart that the Lord wants to restore, something in your life, in your family, the Lord wants you to, the Lord wants to rebuild in your life, work on that. Get right with God and then apologize to that person who you, who you lashed out on. Whatever the Lord's trying to rebuild in your life, The Lord wants to do that. Don't let the enemy try to stop that work from being done. And just as Jesus said in John 17, 4, speaking of the work that Christ came to seek and to say that was lost, he said, Father, I have glorified thee. I have glorified thee and finished the work thou hast given me to do. Read that again. Father, I have glorified thee and finished the work thou hast given me to do. And we know that salvation is by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. Not by works. There's only one work and it's Christ, the work that Christ did for us on the cross and the empty grave. And the moment when you received Him into your heart, you repented of your sins and asked Christ to be your Lord and Savior, nothing could separate you from God's love. And now we get to do the work of God out of love for His love for us. Like Paul said, that the love of Christ compels me. And so may we also... When we come to the end of our days, we don't know when that is. We're not all going to have a deathbed experience. Some of us will. May we say, man, Father, I've, I've finished the work that you've called me to do. Not what culture dictated, or what society is doing, or what others suggested that I do, but I have finished the work that you have given me to do as your servant for your glory. And so, Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you that you speak mightily, God. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, God. And these things that were written in the past were written for our learning and for our edification and for our comfort, God. And we ask, God, that you would help us to take heed to everything that you've spoken to us, God. Whatever word that you've given to us today, God, Lord, help us to take heed to that, God, and to do what you've called us to do, God. And maybe you're just telling us to trust in you. Maybe you're telling us to, hey, receive my peace. Whatever it is, help us to trust in you. Would it help us to submit to those areas that we need to submit to? Lord, I pray, God, if there's anyone that's just struggling through discouragement, struggling through fear, or they feel troubled or frustrated by something, by the enemy, by someone in their life. We know it's the, it's the enemy overall. We ask, God, that you would bind the work of the enemy, God. Lord, I pray that you would help us at this very moment to take our eyes off ourselves, 
take our eyes off the things of this world, the circumstance that we're troubled about, the worries of tomorrow, God, and help us to get our eyes on you, Lord Jesus. We know that in your presence is the fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore, God. And so we ask that you would give your people peace, strengthen us, God, encourage us by your Spirit, Lord, and help us, God, to rest in your grace, walk in your goodness, Lord, and experience that abundant life that you've called us to live, Lord. And it's all for your glory. And so I ask that you would just bless the rest of this evening and that you'd move however you